fourth time's a charm. This is the fourth time I've tried to record this. I can tell you that Hypercam tortured me, Hypercam 2, uh, tortured me and kept putting the audio out of sync and I've looked at all the YouTube videos to tell you how to put it back in sync and honest to God it really didn't work. So here I am recording this again. This is a little video showing you how I process high pr um, contrast images. Um, here's an image at a pug fest on a bright sunny day blasting down on a fawn pug and a hand with a dark jacket and a incredibly dark shadow based on the defaults that Adobe would show. So um, yeah, let's open this up and have a look at what we can do with it. I have another image lying there that I'm going to get rid of. Um, so I've got pretty bright shadows, sorry, pretty bright highlights here. The fur is okay, but it's getting really close to the edge. Um, some spots here are right up at the edge. But that's okay. If this was a JPEG, I'd be in real trouble because these are blocked. I got a lot of zeros, so that doesn't come back. There's nothing you can do with a zero. So we'd lose three channels. We've got black that never changes. But it's not JPEG. It's raw. So what that means is that I can actually drag stuff out of there. So we'll start with my protocol as I prefer it. We'll go to the uh, from the right uh, camera calibration. Unlike the uh, the last tutorial where the RAF file had only Adobe standard, uh, you know, provided by Adobe. In fact, there's quite a few here for the D700. Um, you've got the three that mimic the old D2X, and they're very nice. But we have the new Adobe's. And I'm a big fan of neutral, especially in this circumstance. You can see already we've brought a lot of it back. Um, so that's good. Uh, you know, I could go back to the old 2003 way of looking at things, but frankly the current engine's much better and I don't screw around. Um, shadows here are a bit blue. Um, this is a obvious consequence of having no sunlight on them <clears throat> and all the shadows see is blue skies, so they turn blue. That, you'll see that in every image, and that's just nothing you can do except this. You can actually back off, um, you know, the shadows a little bit if you want. It's not that helpful, but in this case, it does calm the blue a little. No, no harm. So I'm just going to leave it. Uh, this is the 70 to 300 VR lens on a D700. Now this is a full-frame lens, and this is its within its best range, 70 to 200. This lens competes for sharpness with the uh, the twenty one hundred dollar monster. I paid four hundred used for this thing, um, and it competes with the monster uh, not on um, subject isolation and uh, you know speed, but it does compete on sharpness. It's very good within its range of seventy to two hundred. Even at three hundred is pretty good, but that's mainly in the center. So here, I tell it that uh, I want it to do deal with the lens profile. Of course, uh, you saw it. Uh, have barrel applied. In other words, the middle bloomed out. Um, that's because the lens actually, like many um, zoom lenses, has barrel at the wide end and this is closer to the long end, has um, vignetting, not vignetting, <laughs> brain fart. Um, it has um, pin cushion. So, uh, of course, that's where the center goes inward and creates uh, corners that stick out almost like a handkerchief being held at four, four corners. So anyway, uh, this is just applying the reverse. Now I'm going to skip sharpening, which is my next one normally, and go straight into exposure. So what do you do with this mess? This is pretty bad, actually. I mean, it's kind of destroyed. Well, we'll start by getting the white balance right. Um, this isn't bad looking, um, but I've, I've seen images that really didn't look great. Um, where I left it like this, it tends to go with the lower... It's at 4,500 degrees right now, and that's kind of not... 4400 is kind of not really the temperature here so daylight says 55 and and that's more like the way the pug looks and the hand has a little more color so I'll go with this you know it's at this point the difference is mostly personal preference I could open that up and blow her fur completely out that's really not going to fly and you can see here this is not going anywhere I can't open that shadow it's not possible well, actually it is. I just can't open it that way. So let's back it off. Instead, let's save these highlights a little bit. So we pull them back here. 
inside. Now how do we deal with this one? Well, we could deal with it this way, but that's not actually doing anything. I could back off the blacks, which I should. I can lower the contrast, which I should. And that's actually starting to open the shadows. I'm seeing stuff. And then I just add some fill light. This is digital fill. And that's not bad. Now, this is not a pretty image yet. Uh, clearly, it's, um, I don't know, flat. There's no contrast here. There's nothing. But we can take care of that now that we have our histogram looking more normal. In fact, I can actually crank the exposure a touch on that because there is room. I can take it up till I start to see a few of the highlights kick and then I can apply a little recovery on that. Just a little. Now that's getting closer. That's actually, I see her face looks fantastic. Uh, as much as a pug's can. Yuck, yuck. Um, for sharp, not a lot of noise. I mean, there's a little noise there, a little bit of grain, but that's a pretty fine grain, considering I pulled that out of blocked. So, what else would you do here? I could throw a little contrast at it, but I can do that later. I don't have to do that this minute. Throw a little clarity, which is really a local contrast. That's not a bad choice. Just a little bit. Um, throw a little vibrance on it. Throw a little bit more color into the fur and a touch of saturation. That pretty much looks like her. You can see I've got good detail. Um, this is looking really good, but let's open up sharpening and see what. Well, of course, it comes with a certain amount of default sharpening. The anti-aliasing filter has clearly done something here. There is a, a hint of softness, although that is pretty clear detail. But let's put a bit more on. Now that looks pretty nice. We're seeing every little bit of detail on that nose. The fur looks good. Um, I don't seem to have any halos if you look at this. Let's, um, that was not right. I was trying to use the zoom that's normally available in uh, Photoshop. So as I look along the sides, there is essentially no halos here which means that I got my sharpening without actually increasing halos to a visible level. That's awesome. So I really don't need any more um, sharpening along here. This is great. I can mask off a bit, get rid of some of the noise here, because all masking does is say that, you know, of the flat areas, we don't need to apply the same level of sharpening. So if you look at the nose, and now watch it as I dial this up. I can dial it all the way, and yeah, it's starting to get bumped. That's actually too much. It's starting to ask even the nose. So you just back it to about there. The nose is still very sharp. Everything looks good. I can add a touch of detail. That itself is kind of like a very fine-grained um, clarifier, haze cutter, slash, whatever. Um, so that really sucks out a lot of detail. You can hold the Alt key down when you're dealing with these and then you'll see. So that's a black and white image. You just want to make sure that black and white image looks sharp without dealing with color. So as I had it, that looks very sharp. Masking again. How much of this do I not want to get sharpened? Mostly the background. The edges here are showing that it will get sharpened. That's a lot of sharpening. A lot of places where sharpening is visible. But the only important ones, I mean, you don't really need sharpening everywhere. But you can see that the texture along the neck is beautiful. It really picks up every little bit of detail there. Okay, so that's all I would do here. I would not touch that. Um, clearly, if this was 400 ISO and buried in shadow that deeply, there might be some color noise. But it is a D700, so in fact, I don't really see any color noise. Nothing worth dealing with. We just let it leave it back here and it takes care of anything that would have been there. Now we open it. We'll get rid of that uh, experimental thing. Well, this is looking kind of nice on its own. I don't really feel the need to deal with it much more. I could uh, crop it to an 8x10 if I felt like it. Uh, for example, I could go 5x4 here, which is 8x10, close enough. And um, let's see what we get. 
pretty good. I could also slice it off here if I wanted. Just doesn't really matter. This looks quite nice. I think we'll leave it. Okay, so what else do I want to do here? Well, you might want to increase contrast a bit. That's bringing it kind of back to where it was. Maybe we could crank that up a bit. I could go up or I could go down. I could take this down to be more realistic. But then I really need to open that up still. Now I can try this trick using the very targeted, and I could go with that. Add a bit. So what I've done there is I've taken the lighter parts and lightened them, and I've taken the darker parts and put them back to being a little bit dark. And you can see that the curve is still nice, and you know that at least is a nice improvement. So we'll flatten that. I like to flatten as I go along. I don't like building up long stacks of um, uh, edits because, to be honest, I don't worry about going back and redoing. I like to redo. I get a slightly different interpretation each time, and that's just fine. If I think I'm going to do something with it later, I hit Control S and I save the PSD. That version then, in, in for time immemorial, uh, can be adjusted, resized, sharpened for the output, and I can make anything I want out of it. But typically, when I'm just doing snapshots like these, I'll change it to 800 pixels right here. Which I won't do this minute, but uh, the 800 pixel one comes out of an automation from PK Sharpener. No, actually, not the 800 pixel one. That's my, uh, my Sharp Ultrafine over on the right there. That's coming out of here. Um, 800 uh, pixel one is uh, this one, Fit Image. I just don't like reaching into the automations all the time. It's easier just to press a button. Let's me go a little quicker. Um, so I've I've come as far as putting contrast in. It looks quite nice actually. I could live with this easily, but let's let's look at adding some pop, just a bit more pop. So if we throw the local contrast enhancement on here, now you can see that I actually don't have um, any local contrast uh, layer, but I'll just hit Control Z because the last thing they do is crush that down uh, in a merge. So this is the layer with local contrast, and now you can see it makes a big difference. Kind of clarifies everything, gives it pop. Of course, I don't want pop in the background. I want the background to stay smooth. So I will undo Alt, New Layer Mask, and that puts it back to having no effect. And uh, switch this over to white, grab a brush, make it a little bit bigger. I'm holding Alt and right click to do this. You can see that it's um, got some, um, it, it basically is not a hard circle, it's a soft circle. So I just throw this on. Leaving the background as it is, you can see it's throwing some nice cont uh, local contrast on here. There's really not much else to do here. I just want these images this way. So you can see it's the dog's head and torso a bit. And everything else stays as it was. There's no effect on the background, which is exactly what I want. So I flatten that out. What if I want a sharper effect? Uh, clarify is the other filter. Now these two, local contrast and clarify, come out of Noel Carboni's DSLR tools, and I highly recommend these. A very inexpensive set of um, actions. You might like several of them. I happen to like these two. Uh, so clarify is this one, and it runs the same way. Again, Control Z to undo that last part of the action and you can see now that it's a very similar but it's a much um, narrower band effect that it really is more like sharpening in fact you could use USM with very little extra um, halo size and, and you'd get this this is probably mostly what this is although he does tend to be more sophisticated than that so I'm going back and forth here to give you an impression even the jacket looks better so, now, does it affect the background? Yes, it does. It affects it enough that I don't want it. So, again, this time we'll do the same thing. Alt, Layer Mask, White, Brush, Paint. Now we're getting some serious clarity. And I'll let the jacket shine because that just happens to look good. It's the kind of detail that's enjoyable. Um, very nice. Very nice, and of course the grass hasn't been changed. You can just see the jackets spring into clarity. 
um, and you can see here the part that's white is visible, the black is suppressed. Flatten it out. So you've just learned a little bit about painting layer masks if you hadn't ever done it before. It's really pretty easy. You know, if I wanted, you know, I don't know, fool around with it, I could do something like this. Let's say create new layer. Now I have two. Change the blending. Let's make it twice as bright. Screen. Now let's say I just want her face twice as bright. So everything else I want not twice as bright. Alt. Uh, mask. Take the white. Let's, uh, there you go. Doesn't even look that bad, <laughs> actually. Sort of like a light shining on it. So why don't I just cut that to zero, and I'll blend it back gently a little bit. There you go. Actually, darn tootin' if I won't keep that. I kind of like it. Um, I could throw a little bit more contrast on that. Now, again, that's a good curve. I don't want to jack it up at all. Um, I could, you know, take it right to the max. But no, I'm just going to take it away and now just add just a touch more to pop that a bit with the face going back to a little bit darker. That looks really good. That's a really balanced image with uh, the fur looking great and her hand um, perfectly balanced in color. And, uh, you know, this is great. Uh, the face is very clear. The eye is very obvious. Everything's sharp. Uh, I like it. So, final steps. It's in Adobe RGB right now, which um, is how I send it to Photoshop. When I double click the image in Bridge, it came up into ACR. ACR, and I'll do that very quickly again just to show you. ACR, when it brought it in, I, I did my stuff. And then right here, Adobe RGB, which, which it, I'm telling it to send that to Photoshop there. I want it to go as 16-bit full-size 12 megapixel 360 ppi is just a printer hint and 360 is the epson sizing you want it to be linear 360 ppi if you're using a canon printer or most of the other brands 300 ppi if you're going to shoot it over to a frontier printer a fuji frontier at walmart or costco 300 but i use an artisan 50 so it's 360 anyway cancel that since i've already got it loaded now finish it off one of the things this action does and i can show you that taking button mode away. <clears throat> this is pretty ugly looking stuff, but it's really just the action and it, the name becomes a button. 800px does fit image, as I mentioned. JPEG save, convert to profile. So that's really converting to profile sRGB. Uh, choosing a relative, um, <laughs> what does that say again? Oh well, whatever. Uh, yay, yay. There we are. Relative color metrics. So it's basically the mapping mechanism. Uh, relative colors. There are other choices you can... Uh, oh, I can't I can't remember them all. So I'm going to look like a fool on this. Tough luck. Um, black point compensation is nice. It, uh, whatever it is your target is, it'll adjust the black point for you. That's especially useful when the target is paper and a specific printer. That really works well. For this, eh, not so much. The mapping is pretty simple. So when I click this JPEG save, I'm actually taking my Adobe RGB and mapping it onto sRGB, which is the language of the internet and most printers. Um, all browsers will display that relatively well. Most browsers will screw this up horribly. If I were to save it as Adobe RGB, it would look like crap. So I always make sure that I press the JPEG save button to get a JPEG for internet display. And I always make sure that converts to profile. I can always undo it. I can go through my history and back it off. So if I put this back in a button mode and I press that button, Boom. So I now have, well, a pretty darn good looking image. I like the way this looks when you consider that it was blocked shadows everywhere and nearly blown highlights along the fur. That's just about perfect. It doesn't look like a bright sunny day at all. Well, it does because you can see the shadow, but it doesn't look like an overly wildly sunny day. And yet this was pretty strong. So, um, all right, we got uh, 800 pixels done. Uh, right, if I went to history, like I said, you could, you know, back it off, image size, flatten image, master opacity, change to curves, yada, yada, yada. Where did that go? Oh, I haven't done JPEG save yet. Uh, idiot boy. This is the um, um, image size. So, anyway, he'll live. Okay, so... Uh, Right, we did the 800px, now we do the JPEG save. There you go. Um, 
Um, well, we've got a bunch of them, as I said, I've tried this many times. We'll take it to Sophie 4. Now, you know, there's a lot of detail here, a lot of fur. Ah, I forgot something. Here we go. Let's, I mean, now I'm going to show you how this works when you screw up. Okay, I'm going to cancel that. Now, I'd probably like to continue working in the other mode, 16-bit, etc. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get rid of the convert to profile and the 8 bits per channel, because you have to be 8 bits to save as JPEG. You're throwing away all the extra bits, and that's fine, because you're about to print it or something, you don't need the 16 bits. If you're printing it on your local printer, yeah, leave it in 16-bit, and print the PSD, it'll actually look beautiful. Um, but again, you know, 99% of the time, you just aren't going to see a difference. Um, you process in 16 bits because when you start making contrast changes and changing bands of color you will see um, absolutely see posterization if you're not careful if you're running into 8-bit skies will turn posterized it, it just ruins everything so just work in 16-bit if you can which means this is really not an elements type of demonstration because in elements you're always working in 8-bit you know, just be more careful in elements. You know, you won't be able to stretch skies very far. You won't be able to do those kinds of things. Anyway, so backing it up, I want to go back to my image size command. So now I'm back in 16-bit mode. I can prove that. You can see 16 bits is checked. RGB color check. So everything's good. So I'm back where I was. Um, and I want to sharpen it. I'm going to hit the uh, ultra-fine sharpener which came out of PK sharpener output sharpening and there we go so do you, do you notice it? Of course you do in fact it's quite dramatic now what's interesting is it doesn't really have a strong digital flavor but it has a hint of it here especially um, let me just <laughs> get rid of the brush along here um, you can kinda get a digital flavor for it you know there's a bit of a halo there for example not my favorite so back it all the way off and now we're back to kind of normal looking. It's still maybe a bit sharp. I mean, it is a sharp image. Let's just bring it up a touch, get that fur really looking detailed, beautiful. Honestly, I mean, that's about as detailed as it can get. I don't care what lens you use. So flatten that out. Um, pretty gorgeous. Now I'll just save it again. Let's try it, do it right this time, because that would be cool. So if you four. Save. Now what size? Again, as I was saying, with all this hair, etc. Lots of detail. Let's take it up to max. It's really only adding 20-30k. It's not a terrible thing. And we're done. So if I now go compare them, I have the four images I've been doing forever. That's the way I started it off. Not a bad image. Maybe a little too bright along here. Maybe a little too light there. This was the only one I did not set to daylight. And I did set this one to daylight, but I didn't do the crop. So that looks quite nice. Um, you can see the face, very clear. Good enough, really. Here I did the crop. I got more sharpness. Um, the face looks great. More, more contrast. I went for the contrast to your face. And I think that looks pretty all right. Of course, all three completely failed. So again, there's the one I just did. This time I went for an 8x10 crop, which looks good too. Um, lots of sharpness, but not wild sharpness. This one is kind of heavy on the sharpening. That one's heavier than this one. This one is just a little bit more subtle, and I think this is better. Face looks great. I lightened it and then put the local contrast back in. Now, I did that manually by raising this and lowering that using um, that um, control that lets you slide the mouse up and down to choose a certain tone to go up or down. It fiddles the curve very closely, very locally. Um, but you have to be careful because any similar color is going up or down anyway. So you have to, I mean, obviously it can only, it, it doesn't work by color, it works by tone. Um, but works pretty darn good. Um, let's see, what else? Anything else? That's it. Uh, so that's, uh, that's how I deal with high contrast images. A lot of manipulation. What you saw here taking, what are we at now? We're at 13 minutes. What took me 13 minutes here takes me a minute or two um, when I'm processing these images because each one of those just goes tick, 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 done. I don't fool around. Um, here I didn't even run noise uh, reduction. 
could have run Topaz, but there was no point. Maybe I'll do a separate tutorial to show Topaz running um, on a pretty noisy image, because it's, uh, it's interesting stuff to work with. That's that. I hope that was helpful to somebody.